All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Petronas podcast. Today is uh, November 4th, 2022. It is Friday. Uh, it is a beautiful day in Denver. We just had snow last night, and now the sun is shining. Um, this is episode 64 of the Petronas podcast, and I am delighted to introduce my very special guest today, which I've been wanting to have on the podcast for a long time. Um, this is Toby Rice, the CEO of EQT. Welcome to the Petronas podcast, Toby. Hey, good to be here. Awesome. Well, um, as you know, I'm going to do a little intro on sort of what the market's doing in pricing, um, and then we're just going to dive into it. And I think there couldn't be anyone better right now to talk about LNG, natural gas, what's going on in Europe, um, and with the state of your company. You guys are the largest producer in the U.S. Uh, for natural gas, and um, just and we all know that natural gas is a hugely valuable resource, and we need it. So I think it's it's going to be a great podcast. Looking forward to it. Um, so I'm going to timestamp this with, uh, it is November 4th, 2022. WTI is around 91.32. We have seen a lot of fluctuations in that. of have seen eight handles and nine handles. Brent is 97.48. Henry Hub has moved back up over six at 6.15. Dutch TTF, another wild ride. We're about 36 bucks in MMBTU. And that is, you know, I always have to say this because I don't know if people reference it, but we were at 100 in August. So this this crazyville on the net gas side. And that doesn't take into account, I think, European electricity prices, which we've really we still see very high, you know, uh, very high UK prices and electricity, very high German electricity prices. Uh, the 30 year mortgage rate is above 7.7 percent. It is 7.29 percent. And the 10 year yield, which that correlates to, is well above 4 percent. And that was all, a lot of that was based on the Fed rate hike this week, uh, which we don't have to get into. I'll do that on another podcast. Any and all of what's going on in the world, Toby, you are welcome to, you know, uh, push me on, talk to me, ask questions, whatever. Um, I will preface this, that Toby and I were on a panel. I think it was in, this was in April, actually. We were on a panel uh, sitting together in a, a JP Morgan conference or little event in Pittsburgh. And um, panel was very fun. We did argue a little bit on... Um, on the market and you pushed me on oil prices. We talked a bit about ESG. Um, and I think Toby thought we were going to duke it out on stage, which we did not. Um, we, we, it was a really good conversation. This is why it's great to have a guest. Cause I know he doesn't completely agree with me. Um, and, or me with him, which is fantastic. Um, I really like that. And it's nice to argue with people. So, um, let's start with, uh, let's start with the global macro and LNG. And just, I want to give people a reference of, you know, what the hell's going on in the world in terms of, you know, how much we produce. I think people know we produce a lot of gas, but we produce 119 BCF a day of gross withdrawals. You guys, you guys produce a, if I'm correct, around six BCF a day of, of what you're bringing to the market. I mean, that's a massive volume for a single operator. Is that correct? That is correct. Six BCF a day. And I think one of the ways that we help make it uh, relevant to people that aren't familiar with gas units, six BCF a day is the energy equivalent of about a million barrels a day of oil. So it's a big footprint. When you look at um, just energy production in the United States, while the GT is number one on natural gas, just total energy using a six to one conversion. Um, number one energy producer, Trish, who do you think it is? Um, I'm guessing the number one energy producer would be you if you're six BCF a day. Nope, it's not us. We're number three. Number one Exxon should be, uh huh. Nope, Conical Phillips number one. Number two, oh, okay. Oxy, and then mm -hmm. number three is uh, EQT. Okay, on a total US, BOE basis. Just U.S. U.S. production. Yep. Just U.S. production. Okay. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Um, and just for context, I mean, for like folks here in Colorado in the DJ, I mean, we're producing three BCF a day. So. Six BCF a day, the Marcellus is pumping out 34 BCF a day, 35 BCF a day, massive quantities of gas. Um, and that's in this whole, you know, nearly 120 BCF a day. We have a 400 BCF a day market. And so if we take this back to Europe, and we're going to come back to the US, but I think we should take this back to Europe because everybody puts these percentages to it. And it's, to me, a little annoying. Um, so European production, this is sort of the, I gave a presentation yesterday uh, to a group in Denver and, you know, talked a lot about uh, energy insecurity and sort of what has happened in Europe and what not to do in the U.S. and the path that we're trending down. But, you know, Russia produces 68 BCF a day. Um, that was 2021, right? That's not actually, that's a frat, that's almost half, um, less than half, almost half of basically what we produce. Um, 
one uh, of the exposure that that Europe had, and it was sort of maximum exposure and maximum leverage, right? Europe had so much exposure to Russia. Russia had maximum leverage in this whole situation. And really, the money was coming from oil. And I think that's important for people to realize. So Europe's exposure, they produced 20 BCF a day. They consumed 55 BCF a day. And they were importing 16 billion cubic feet per day via pipe and 1.7 billion cubic feet per day via LNG just from Russia alone. So that exposure is we're looking 18 BCF a day of exposure. And that is what you and a lot of folks in the U.S. are actually trying to solve for is sending those molecules abroad into the European market. And we have seen so much fluctuation in that. Something that bothers me, though, is that you know, Europe is not willing to sign long-term contracts with so, Europe. What? Well, so, I, I mean, that's what that, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm hearing from different entities. So I'm assuming that's changing, but we haven't seen a big move in mass in long-term contracts, despite all the craziness that's going on in Europe. So I'd love to talk to you about that of the state of what's going on in Europe. We know there's storage. You know, have at it. Yeah. So l- my perspective on what's going on with the world, um, we are in an energy crisis that everybody knows about and um, the unnecessarily high energy prices, the rampant inflation, Putin's influence on the world stage wreaking havoc. And uh, by the way, emissions around the world are still soaring. Um, What's really, what's really amazing is that just how bad this has gotten. Um, You've got a really unique situation where you've got environmentalists like Greta Thunberg and energy executives like myself, that agree that our approach towards energy transition has not been smooth, has not been effective. And it's, it's really been, a, a it, it's all come to light. And, and the, the, the tough part we have now is, you know, what do, what do we do? Because I think this is a really important split in the road because the anti-energy policies have made it very tough for us to do the work that we do. Um, and, and that has caused a significant amount of underinvestment in traditional energy sources like natural gas and oil. And that's left, left the world energy short. And that's a really scary place for the world to be in, because when the world is energy short, um, people tend to tend to, the ultimate is people start fighting. And because energy is is I mean, it's it's what keeps people warm. It's what keeps people safe. And it's also what, what keeps economies running. And countries will fight for that. And I do not believe that the conflicts we're seeing between, you know, Europe and in Europe right now with Russia, it's not going to be the last conflict that we see. And so we've got to get a grip on energy security, not just for the United States, but for the world. And it's a it's a it's a very divert path and that two two different paths are out there because we've got you know, while, while we agree with, with Prima, I think everybody can agree that the approach we've taken with the energy transition has put us in this position. It hasn't been great. The solutions and the way we get out of it is, is where the paths really start to diverge. And on one hand, you've got groups that say, hey, I see this. I told you oil and gas is bad. Um, look at all these, these problems that we're having right now. We need to double down on alternative energy solutions. Um, now, my perspective is I think doubling down on on these type of solutions and doubling down on these policies that ultimately move us away from oil and gas is doubling down on the high prices. It's doubling down on rampant inflation. It's doubling down on Putin's influence on the world stage. It's also doubling down on our our inability to address rising emissions around the globe. You know, our solution though, and, and what we've been talking about a lot is we need to unleash American energy. And only in doing that are we going to be able to provide energy security that the world needs and energy security for Americans? We're also going to be unleashing the biggest green initiative on the planet and it'll allow us to do two things at once, provide energy security to the world while also lowering global emissions. And so um, that's a world that we're talking about. We've made a lot of headlines with our Unleash US LNG campaign yeah. uh, and, and we can get into it, but the, 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 the pivot for us right now is to really start amplifying the message on not just the environmental benefits of unleashing American U.S. LNG on the world stage, but also um, talking about how unleashing U.S. LNG is going to be the biggest source of energy security for Americans in the world, the key to lower prices and, Absolutely. and um, how we can how we can how fast we can get this going. So. I think those are excellent comments, and I agree with most of them. Um, 
I mean, and I, I think we're on, the, we're on the same page in terms of, you know, the vulnerability of Europe and, and uh, you know, conflict. Um, I think this is probably the very beginnings of stages of, I don't think this is going to, the war in Ukraine is going to end anytime soon, nor did Putin intend it to. Um, and I think China's very involved and China doesn't intend this to end anytime soon as well. Um, and they're sort of benefiting extensively from this and also funding it. So, but with all that, and I do want to get into, we'll get, we'll get into Mar- Marcellus and, and building pipelines and all that. And I, I you have went through, you know, rewent through your last few earnings calls. And I do love that you point out something, um, which you just commented on. And it, it's something I think a little counter as a public company that people would say, okay, well, you're going to be lowering prices. And I think a lot of folks don't realize how beneficial the stable prices are, right? It's not lowering prices. Of course, a buck 50 doesn't work too bucks doesn't work three bucks doesn't work but you know six dollar range is healthier than you know especially for the consumers definitely healthier than 10 and when we saw these 10 handles on on gas that gets really scary because when we think about what's sticky in our economy we consume a lot of natural gas and the reason i push back on the esg side a little bit is just because we were already doing this so the u.s was was pushing because of operators like yourselves who produce so much natural gas and lowered the price of natural gas. We had the shale revolution. Um, we're very good at producing natural gas. I want to get into the technicals of a little bit on the nerdy side. And, you know, your lateral lengths are north of 15,000 feet. You guys are killing it on completions as we know how to produce natural gas in the U.S. The ability to do this at, you know, 20 BCF a day of associated gas out of the Permian. This is not I mean, this is science, um, but we know how to do this in the U.S. and we can do it. So we can we can easily solve this this global problem. But the thing is, we were already doing that in the U.S. and we were already on a downward trajectory of lowering our emissions. So when we talk about emissions and we talk about ESG and I I don't you know, and Greta Thunberg is an advocate. You know, she has written a recent book called um, The Climate Book and has been actually criticized by the BBC because it doesn't say anything. And she's a young woman and I respect her for her passion because I have equal amount of passion and I'm crazy about this business and I'm crazy about business in general, but I disagree with with just being an advocate and having no substantive information behind it. You have to know what you're talking about. And she definitely does not, nor do most leaders in Europe, actually, when they're talking about this. And we have the International Energy Agency, who has a very amplified voice, who's become an advocacy organization as well, who, you know, is is pretty damning on their recent report on oil is just I mean, it's atrocious in their world energy outlook, Um, but it's also bad on gas. So, you know, they're calling for they're basically saying this energy crisis was had nothing to do with clean energy. And, you know, all energy had a role to play in this. But clean energy was certainly a part and there was nothing to do with clean energy and that they are calling for massive reductions in natural gas because of the CO2 emissions from that. And the problem I have with that is one, it's desperately needed. It reduces CO2 emissions. Um, It works really well. You know, this we don't have to go on and on about how amazing it is to be exporting propane. Um, to Africa and, you know, the ability to heat homes with this and all the good it does. Um, but it's also sort of where the trajectory of the world was going anyway. The, the real problem is that we, to your point of we've increased emissions, we have. I mean, in 2021, it, I mean, China's been increasing emissions like crazy regardless because they're burning so much coal. And that has a lot to do with energy security in China. And so energy security, when we get it, when we have volatility in the gas side, We incentivize coal Uh, because coal, you can dig it up out of the ground. You can stick it next to your power plant and you can burn it. You don't have to put it into a fancy tanker. You don't have to ship it. I mean, it's easier to ship around the world. It's easier to move around in your own country. And China's producing 400 million tons of coal. They've added over a thousand terawatt hours of power generation just last year alone. When I know people in this industry, we throw out the the China numbers a lot. But when you're we have over 3,000 3, operating coal-fired power plants. You have 200 in construction. You have another 200 permitted, another 200 pre-permitted. The coal is stacking up. So the point is, is that it is a lot about energy security and doing what you can do. You're probably not going to change the China situation because that's about energy security for them. So to me, it needs to be a little bit more focused on, you know, providing the energy security a little bit less on, you know, getting the numbers on the CO2 emissions right because um, I don't think China's going to allow us to do that. Mm. Yeah. You were on a, you were on a, you were on a, you were on a, you were on a rant there. Um, I was saying you are a fact machine. Nobody spits more facts in a shorter period of time than Trisha Curtis. Um, but here's, here's my perspective on, you, you mentioned. That's, not, that's what I want. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So here, here's what I think has happened. We've placed so much focus on as a, as a world asking the question, what can each country do to lower their emissions? And what we've ended up with is a situation where you've got countries like the United States have been a world leader and lowered their emissions almost a billion right. tons over the last 15 years. But 
around the world, um, emissions around the world have skyrocketed and they're up over 7 billion tons to over 36 billion tons. So that's a major jump up. Clearly, um, just con continuing to focus on just what the United States can do is not going to be enough. And we need to start asking a bigger question, which is what can each country do to lower emissions outside of their borders? We should still continue to, to look at ways to reduce emissions within our borders, but only when we start thinking about what we can do to help decarbonize the world is where we're going to come up with truly sustainable solutions that make an impact. And, you know, when you look at emissions around the world, as you mentioned, it's really simple. It's foreign coal. It's half of the emissions in the world come from foreign coal. And there's some people, though, that will say, well, Tobe, what's your what's your plan? I say, well, it's really simple. It's let's use let's do exactly what we did in the United States, but do it on a global stage. Use natural gas to replace coal. Every time we put a BCF a day on the water to replace foreign coal, we are saving over 30 million tons of emissions. And uh, when you look at how 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 big this impact could be, um, we have the ability to increase our natural gas production an incremental 50 BCF a day and hold it flat for over 30 years. And yeah, on top of massive. that, the inventory we have. Uh, we've already discovered, thanks to the shale revolution, the inventory, we can set a filter and say only the inventory that makes sense at a gas price less than $4. So we can make reliable energy and cheap energy. And because it's going to be decarbonizing coal, it's going to be clean. And that is a huge, um, it, it's why it, it's it's the biggest environmental initiative that's out there right now, if you care about lowering, lowering emissions. But um, there's people out there, Trish, that'll say, you know what? We don't need you. You know, we don't need oil and gas anymore. We, we've got solar and we've got wind and we're just going to turn the knob and just invest more in solar and wind. Well, here's one thing I think that's really important for people to understand and where I think the shortcoming is in that type of type of thinking. Uh, people really don't understand how much energy demand there is in this world. Like, how could anybody get their heads wrapped right. around that? It's a big thing to, to think about. But they don't understand that, and and I can't blame them for that. It's a big it's a big concept, but the reality is when solar and wind cannot meet the energy demand of the world, people are going to use coal. That's what happens. And in the last twelve months, they're solar actually going to use oil too. Yeah, solar and wind's inability to to meet world demand for energy has caused coal use to skyrocket, and emissions from coal have increased over five hundred million tons. And to put that in perspective, that wipes out all of the emissions reductions we've done here in the United States from solar and wind over the last 15 years. That is a big point. 12 months of not addressing foreign coal has wiped out 15 years of solar and wind investments here in the United States. Clearly, foreign coal is a big issue and it requires a heavyweight solution to address it. And that heavyweight solution is U.S. natural gas on the world stage unleashing U.S. LNG. Okay. So, and that's, that's a great, I mean, I'm with you on all that. I think the emissions thing is a bit of a whack-a-mole game. So we may have to table that because if it's just, it's moving up here and there in different places, I'm all, all for you on, on, you know, on producing as much natural gas in the U S as possible. The, the question I have in wanting to bring this home a little bit and we'll, we'll, we'll pivot back um, globally, I think in a second, but, and go in different directions, but so if, if this is the, you know, we're unleashing LNG, we're sending all this, you know, we're, we're sending all this, domestic U.S. production abroad. We're using it at home. This is great. The, the issue I have on a couple fronts is that, you know, the movement against oil and gas and the, the anti-movement, you know, and I, I do, I ask, you know, a lot of public companies this, and it's totally okay if, if you don't, if you're uncomfortable answering it, but the folks that want you to get out of oil and gas, they don't really want to see you, at, you know, they don't want to see holes being poked into the ground. And so when you see like the World Benchmarking Alliance and you listen to a lot of shareholder calls, um, it's entities that want, you know, like 73% of CapEx out of oil and gas and into lower carbon. Um, that's not a sustainable solution for an operator in any way. It's not actually sustainable for, you know, what engine number one pushed on Exxon. That is not about Exxon making money. We we, we both know and everyone knows that wind and solar have not be, have yet to be profitable anywhere in the world. They are not profitable businesses. And they really do reduce grid. I mean, the grid instability issue is a whole nother factor. But we have grid stability, especially in the U.S. Yeah. with this natural gas. So the two things are that I want to ask you are, you know, 
what about the divest the, that whole movement? And I know that this is maybe your your response to it, but that sort of gets me. Every time operators are just like, "Hey, we're we're you know we're doing all this stuff." Is that actually moving the needle? Is that helping? Are you? Is that making a difference in terms of how people are thinking about that divestment movement? Yeah. So, really, the divestment movement, the ES is is really being driven by ESG, um, and doesn't seem like the world is is too sustainable now, does it? Right. Um, what's actually here, here's a really remarkable stat for you. Um, when there there was one organization, I think it was the World Economic Forum they would assign sustainability scores to different countries and on a scale of zero to hundred higher numbers, better. They assigned, uh, Sri Lanka, I think it was number three or number fifth most sustainable country on it had an ESG score of like 96, which is ridiculous. And do you know what happened to Sri Lanka over the last couple months? Yes. Well, civil revolution. Yep. They canceled chemical fertilizers, Immediately, less than 12 months later, food shortage, revolt, complete overthrow of, mm-hmm. of, uh, of of the government. Not sustainable. So you could say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be doing this ESG. Well, my opinion on ESG hasn't changed at all. But let me tell you why. Because I've never wavered from the true intent of what ESG is all about. What it was originally designed for was long-term sustainable profitability. That's what ESG was was put out for. And unfortunately, I feel like when you ask people what ESG is, they say, oh, it's the environment, it's reducing emissions. That's because the balance has been shifted out of whack right. on the environmental and we forgot about the, the S, S and the G. And the G. So I think now, now more than ever is when we need to lean into ESG, but bring it back to, it's about long-term sustainable profitability. And to be honest with you, for us to have a long-term sustainable future in oil and gas, we have got to take care of the environment and we have got to provide energy security for the world. And guess what? We are not addressing people's concerns over emissions and we are not providing energy security to the world right now. Now, we have a lot of reasons that we could say our pipelines have been being blocked. We've been challenged and opposed at every turn and, you know, uh, so we have excuses, but this pressure against our industry is not going to stop um, until we provide until we address people's concerns over emissions. And what's really remarkable when we looked at we we, sh- we we've been talking about you know the lack of pipeline infrastructure has been the biggest challenge for us to be able to continue to do the great work we do and put more energy into this world. We put a chart out on I think Twitter um, on just like pipelines that were built and then pipelines that were canceled. And what was really remarkable is when you color the bars, um, we went from a period of time in two, from 2006 up to around 2016, where every single mile of the pipeline that we wanted to get built, got built. But from 2016 forward, all the pipelines seemed to have gotten blocked and canceled. Now, what happened there that made that, that made that move? It's not because we forgot how to build pipelines in 2016. It's not because regulation changed, um, same regulations. But what changed, what, what I believe happened was in 2016, the EPA came out and said hydraulic fracturing is safe. And for people that want to see a world without oil and gas, because of their concern for, for emissions, um, they're going to go after our tools. And w- when 95% right. of the wells in the country require hydraulic fracturing, um, that's what, that was the approach. And in 2016, the marker came down and said, that's not going to be an effective tool to, to, to call the public to, to shut us down. So they went back to the drawing board and in 2017, they recalibrated and they came back in 2018 and absolutely crushed our ability to get pipelines. And so what do we do, Trish? Do we convince people that pipelines are safe? Guess what? Secretary Granholm already said pipelines are the most effective way to, to, to move energy. And, well, she said a lot of things, but yes. And, and even even when we get the pipelines and people know, there's going to be another environmental concern. And right now, that environmental concern is methane emissions, and that's and that that's a reason why people say we shouldn't be doing oil and gas production. And guess what? This industry, just like our ability to respond to hydraulic fracturing, just Absolutely. like our ability to justify pipelines, we're going to knock methane emissions out of the park. Yep. That's going to happen. We can do it cost effectively. We can do it quickly, but. 
even when we do that, there's going to be something else and something Absolutely. else and something else. We've got to address the root cause of this pushback. Let's get on sides with with the the environmentalists. What they want is lowering emissions. We're going to provide a solution that is going to be the biggest green initiative on the planet, equivalent to electrifying every vehicle in the country, putting solar panels on every house in America, and also doubling U.S. wind wind capacity combined. That's the environmental benefits of unleashing U.S. LNG, and you know, we have to have the courage after that is if we find ourselves in a world where natural gas is the, isn't the the cheapest, most reliable, cleanest form of energy, then we have to have the courage to say, guess what? And there's a, there's a, there is a sustainable replacement for us that's better. We have to have the courage to say, we've got to step aside. Now that's never going to happen because natural gas is going to be the cheapest, most reliable, cleanest form of energy and natural gas can be transformed into a zero carbon energy solution. We know how to do it with hydrogen or through carbon capture. Saying, you're investing in it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So I, I, but what's really interesting when you think about this, you know, this is going to address, I think a lot of the concerns that people have about our industry. And here's the most amazing part about it. You know, the world is, is clearly calling for cleaner energy and this industry is, is, is hearing that. And what's really concerning and exciting at the same time concerning is that people are trying to do this energy transition without oil and gas exciting is that this industry is going to be the one that finds the holy grail of cheap reliable zero carbon energy we're the only industry that is that is dealt with a massive energy crisis we're the only energy industry that has carried the weight of the world on its shoulders and our ability to solve these crises, which by the way, was, was the energy shortages back before the shale revolution, when we were relying on OPEC and, you know, we needed to find our energy independence who found that it wasn't solar. It wasn't wind. It was us, the shale producers. And what we've done is, was an absolute, you know, miracle to crack the code on shale, the innovation, the technology, the collaboration, um, to be able to crack the code and get commercial volumes of, of, of energy out of this, what I consider trash rock, if you think about it, mm -hmm. is a miracle. And the result of that, we went from a very bleak future to transform the United States into the energy powerhouse of the world. We are the swing producer in the world. People should not forget that. And the good news about this whole thing is that all those bright minds that made that happen this didn't happen that long ago. They're still working in this industry. And now we've been able to make our energy cheaper. We've been able to do all the exploration so that we know we've got decades and decades of low cost inventory, thanks to the shale revolution. Now it's about, we hear you making our energy cleaner and you're gonna see the amount of emissions reductions that are being reported across this industry are is awesome to see. Give us another 24 months and we're gonna make serious, serious headway addressing um, the latest concern with methane emissions. And now you've got this industry that's a proven innovator to do it at scale with sustainable, sustainable way, which means profitable. Now looking to, to, to find the holy grail of energy, we're going to be the ones that do that and deliver that for the world. And then we're going to have a future and our future, we, we will have our future. If we can achieve our higher purpose, provide energy security to the world and lowering emissions, that is going to give us the ability to have a bright future and continue to, to do the great work that we do for the benefit of the entire world and Americans. Well, OK, so again, agree with you on most points. I, I the, the pressure isn't going to go away. So um, you're 100 percent right in the show revolution and what's been done um, and in this industry. And obviously, you're a young person. I think you've got show Lenial on your Twitter handle. Um, so, I mean, the, the biggest thing I think this industry needs to do is advocate for themselves. And so this industry is kind of, we are a duck and cover industry. I'm third generation oil and gas. I, I know, I know this business. I know it's a boom and bust business. It is not easy. And, you know, the pressure though, from an ESG standpoint and the way the industry leaned into it, I have been very, very uncomfortable. The iHeart net zero and given that net zero came from Paris climate accords, came from the, 
International Energy Agency and that the International Energy Agency is calling for, you know, an immediate reduction of 25 million barrels a day by 2030. And, and uh, so we're talking about 75 million barrels a day, a 25 million barrel a day drop from now to 2030, which is not going to happen in oil demand and very similar for gas. So, you know, I think the idea that I know what you're doing, and I absolutely agree that doing ESG right and doing business right, this industry, we will solve the methane problem. We will solve all these problems. As every challenge that gets pushed, this, I mean, we're an extremely technical and innovative industry. It's going to be solved. But I don't think the pushback is going to be solved. But there's sort of this, irregardless of that, it's happening anyway. So as much as people have pushed electric vehicles, well, well, as much as people push the yeah, solutions... But- we have not yep. seen a, you know, we're still 100 million barrels a day of demand and we're, we are continually rising on natural gas demand. And that's mm-hmm. because th- those are the solutions. Those are the most technically yeah. feasible options and they hold, they have a high BTU content. Yeah. Trish, one thing to consider though, you know, I don't think this industry's ever really made an environment centric first argument for why uh, we can address people's concerns. And also, the education um, and the awareness on how to how to lower emissions. The, the world is still getting their heads wrapped around climate and how to do it. And unfortunately, you know, thanks to social, so thanks to, to everybody being plugged in their cell phones, there's a lot of information out there that is has I believe misled people into thinking they can live. It's a crap ton of disinformation, and you without, don't have a media that. Product. I mean, yeah, yeah. But it's not hard to understand if if you like. I mean, listen, I don't know when you when you came into this, but somebody told me three years ago, they said, Tobe, did you know we're using more coal in this world than we ever had before? I said, what? No way, because we've done such a good job, you know, using more evolved forms of energy like natural gas and, and decreased our usage of coal. Like I was thinking, surely everybody else around the world is doing that. And guess what? People don't really understand how the energy systems works. So they do not. If they, it, that's a very simple gap to, to, to show people and say, if you care about emissions, it's not about, you know, plastics. It's not about agriculture. Right. It's about, you know, replacing, evolving our forms of energy. And one of the biggest wins that we can do that's proven and sustainable is replacing coal with natural gas. People get it. And I've done meetings for, I've done over 80 meetings um, with all, all members of our leadership you know, mostly talking with, with, you know, people that have been out there saying, you know, no more investing in oil and gas. And I'm sitting down with these people. And when I sit down with them, I say, how much time do we got? They say, you got 15 minutes, Tobe. And we're talking 45 minutes later, we're still talking about how these opportunities can meet their, their ambitions and allow us to meet our ambition to provide energy security for the world and provide a great future, you know, for our children. Um, because it's it's practical and it, it makes sense, but the the really hard part here is I understand like the challenge for us to be able to unleash U.S. LNG comes down to what we need is we need to build LNG facilities and pipelines faster than we've ever done it before, and I I fully appreciate what we are saying to the world is you've been blocking pipelines because of your concerns for the environment, now you need to support pipelines because of your concern for the environment. And that's going to take some time for people to switch. And I, I will tell you. Okay, this so let's time. let's that that that's where. So let's let's take that moment and and talk about that because for all the talk about that, and it is a bit. I wouldn't say it's infuriating, but everyone talks about that. Of, well, we, we'll just do this and it'll be solved. Now, look, Joe Manchin, who I'm not a perfect fan of, um, but I think he was he was leading sort of the MVPs for the conservative side, you know, for most of the year and, and blocked a lot of ludicrous climate change stuff but then sort of went for it. Now, a part of why he went for it, obviously he is pro coal, he's pro energy, seems to be pro energy independence, um, but he seemed to be pro pipeline as well and was was helping to push this MVP pipeline. The problem is, and you guys said this in your earnings call very clearly, was, hey, we're at capacity, you know, and I, I'm looking at the wells that you're adding each year, you know, the Marcellus has really declined the actual wells that are brought on each year. And that's, really quite sad given this is a monster gas formation. You know, we can produce this. I mean, Chris Wright was talking about the Marcellus in his last earnings call, um, talking about how you were not getting the Marcellus 
you know, natural gas into the power plants in the Northeast. And the Northeast has such massive grid instability because of this. But we're looking at, you know, 2020, a thousand wells in the Marcellus were added. 2021, obviously less than 934. And 2022, we're, we're averaging about 500. So I'm guessing it's not going to be too far at the end of the year. But you guys have really had to drop your wells from 235 in 2018 to 2021, 104. And right now you're about 34 wells. So this really comes down to, I think, as you said very clearly, hey, we're a pipeline capacity. We have to do make these wells great, which are 15,000 feet and seem to be crushing it. Um, and these are monster wells. But what is the, I mean, where are you at on the technical? So no bullshit, you know, bullshit aside on the technical side of this business of getting a pipeline developed where are we at? Because you're, you're, I love when you say the seven BCF a day that we've had canceled, which is such a great stat of, of these are the pipelines canceled. So what is it going to take to actually get a pipeline built out of the Marcellus? Or, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's you're exporting more on the East coast or the facilities that, but love to know your business to grow for this to work. Um, we have to have a pipeline. So where are we at on that and how does it happen? Yeah. I think it starts by just looking at, um, the ridiculous situation we have right now. I mean, traditionally when we've had, you know, people say the cure for high prices is high prices because those high prices are going to incentivize right. more development and supply will follow and, and balance the supply demand and prices will come down. That works when the market is able to, to work. Well, right now I'm telling you the market is broken and what's broken is our inability to have enough infrastructure that can connect our supply with demand. The demand is still there. Um, And think about how crazy this is, where the biggest producer of natural gas in the country that has, that can generate returns with this pricing environment, um, cannot add, is not adding more production. And the reason is very simple. We are out of pipeline capacity. And What's even more, and and so here's a really absurd thing that's happening. In Boston this winter, they're going to be paying over $25 for their natural gas. I'm going to be selling that same gas in Pennsylvania for a price of six bucks. Yep. Now, and they still use heating, they still use diesel to heat their homes. That's right. And these these type of, of issues are now starting to be felt by Americans because let's not forget, when pipelines were getting canceled, it's when natural gas prices Absolutely. were below three dollars, and I think people have gotten a, uh, a a false sense of comfort that hey, we've been blocking pipelines for five years. Why is it now an issue? Well, it's an issue because you didn't realize that this industry we build extra capacity, Absolutely. for, and, and that is part of our energy security. But what those pipelines would have done is they would have given us the more cushion, but without having that cushion over the past five years, we've just chewed up all of our industrial capacity. And now we're And you guys have a great, just to shout out to listeners, you guys have a great slide in one of your recent, uh, in one of your recent earnings decks. And you, you noted, I think it's the back end of your deck where you put out the timeline for that. And when we've, we've canceled pipelines and where the timelines and what natural gas prices are. And I think that's a, it's a fantastic slide and it's really where, you know, it's great, but still, I, I still want to, and so, so here's what I, here's what I think is, here's what I think is important. People need to understand number one, the, the, the root cause of the challenge for, for our industry is, is from people's concerns about emissions. Let's agree on that. Um, root cause. I think the root, the, no, I I think there, no root cause of the opposite. Well, you can make an argument that if, okay, I want to hear, I want to hear what you think the root cause. So I think there are, I don't think it's a root cause. I think there's a good amount of folks, um, um, who are the keep it in the ground. And unfortunately I do think that, um, this current administration is beyond inept in terms of understanding energy. And I, I really, so there's a in the U.S. right now, as the as the largest, you say we're the swing producer. We're the largest oil and gas producer in the entire world, and we're exporting 10 million bar- over 10 million barrels a day of crude and natural gas liquids, and another 12 BCF a day of gas. Um, so you know, huge. But you will never hear that on CNBC. You will never hear on Bloomberg, the places that you go to talk. And when when Biden gets up and he speaks and he and he says something ridiculous on energy policy and he alludes to a windfall tax, you don't even hear criticism by the people who, on Bloomberg and CNBC because we. We don't even have a healthy conversation anymore about we're not even allowed to criticize this stuff. And to me, we, we've sort of lot. I mean, we're, we're trending down a really bad track there, but it, it 
does come to the core of, of sane energy policy and, and folks understanding what's going you, to all the things that you said, people not understanding energy. I do really do believe that there are a lot of folks deeply concerned about climate and CO2 emissions. I don't, not sure they really understand weather and climate and this whack-a-mole problem we have across the world. And that just, you know, actually, even if we solve a lot of these challenges, um, intense weather events don't actually work well with wind and solar or electric vehicles. So there's just a lot of technical factors here that are that are hard to, for folks to wrap their arms around, which you said very clearly of just understanding energy, I think demand is one of those. Um, so I don't think necessarily the root cause is just CO2 emissions. That being said, I, I appreciate your perspective on that. And we can sort of table that because I still think, I think um, your perspective is, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it's unique, but I think it's good, and it and it and it makes sense. Well, um, I just disagree with it. Yeah. Well, I don't, I, the the question is, yeah. I mean, if you say it's people want to keep it in the ground, but like, why do they want to keep it in the ground? They want to keep it in the ground because they're concerned over climate. I mean, people are scared, and so for me, that's the that's the starting point of any solution that allows us to get back to do the work we do. Is we've got to address their root cause. Right. Now, so, but if you think you address that, I think it's also political. And so the, my question for you on the pipeline side is, you know, how do we get, how do we get that right now when we desperately need it and you desperately need it? What's the technical thing that, you know, folks like, what can we do to, I know everybody's educating and everybody's passionate about, and that we're doing this is that, um, you know, we have FERC requirements, you know, the same things holding up wind and solar um, and, and actually building it out. And we have legal issues building out transmission lines, but we have to build a pipeline and that's being blocked. So is the just advocating we're going to solve CO2 emissions, is that going to be enough? What, what is it going to take to get a pipeline built? We have, we have to start and, and show people that, the solutions that they're supporting with us to build these pipelines is going to bring them a step closer towards their climate ambitions. Okay. That's number one. The other thing is I think across the political spectrum, everybody cares about energy prices and affordability and inflation. Okay. And how can we, how can we provide solutions that will address the energy security issues that we're facing here in America? How can a solution do that? And this is what's really amazing because, you know, and in, in, in light of, you know, OPEC cutting production 2 million barrels a day and our administration, you know, really being frustrated with OPEC uh, and making that decision. But here's what they need to know. They need to know when we unleash US LNG, we are going to be creating a 60 BCF a day surplus here in the United States. And exports allow us to have surplus and surplus means lower prices and energy security. The administration wants a spigot, you know, for, for energy here. We can create a turn it on and off. We could yeah, well, we can create that spigot. So there's two two points. This surplus is gonna allow us to bring massive energy security and lower prices to Americans, you know, really a couple of different ways. Number one, it's gonna give us the ability to respond to high prices. Assuming we have the pipeline infrastructure, right, right now when I push the button on my desk to add rigs. It takes about 18 months for me to get the permits, drill the wells, frack them, hook them up to sales. That's not very responsive. But in a no. situation where we have this surplus already above ground flowing through the pipelines, we can respond to high prices in 18 hours. That's the spigot for America. I think everybody would agree that that is a good feature. The second thing is that this amount of surplus is going to ensure that our storage levels always stay full. That's going to eliminate volatility and bring more sustainable pricing that all businesses and American consumers can plan on. And the last thing I think is the most important, and this is absolutely critical, considering we are in an energy short world, this amount of energy on the world stage is going to insulate the United States from the geopolitical risks that happen in hydrocarbons. Um, as an example, when bombs dropped in Ukraine in February, natural gas prices in Europe went from $25 to 40. They went up $15 in the United States. They went up 15 cents. Why is that? It's because of us, because of what we do. That American production base is the shield. And we're talking about creating a shield that's 50% larger. And, you know, in context of OPEC and them having the ability to flex up and down, how do, how should we respond to that? Here's my solution. Unleash US LNG is the energy that's 60 BCF a day is the energy equivalent of 10 million barrels a day of mm -hmm. oil, but it's clean energy and it's going to be a decarbonizing force. And so if OPEC wants to, you know, torque down production volumes, 
we should be unleashing an energy an, an energy uh, equivalent of 10 million barrels a day. That's like adding another Saudi Arabia to the world stage. And the United States is going to be is going to hold the keys to that energy security. It's going to bring peace. It's going to bring prosperity. It's going to bring lower energy prices to Americans. And it's going to allow the United States to influence and promote, you know, freedom and democracy. I think those points are things that everybody in this world can do. But the challenge is we just need people to pick their heads up and reassess their views. And, and you know, I think once you do that, then we can get back on track to doing practical solutions. And the last thing I'd say that, that this is probably the most important thing about it um, is this is an energy transition plan. Make no mistake about it. We are transitioning the world from coal to natural gas. And also with this amount of surplus of natural gas, we're going to be able to transition in, to a lower carbon energy future here in America. But the most important part about this is this. When I say this is sustainable, um, I'm not just talking about the environment. I'm talking about the fact that this plan is profitable and it's value creating for society. We believe we can put natural gas on the doorstep of Europe for a cost of $12. And that would imply a $4 gas price here in the United States. You ask, ask yourself, would Europeans like to get their energy at, at $12 natural gas price? Absolutely. They were paying $30. They're paying $30 today. They were paying 80, um, absolute train wreck for high energy prices. They'd be doing yep. backflips for $12, $12 and Americans $4 gas price, put that in perspective. That's lower than the 20 year average price of natural gas. Of and those, $4. and, and Toby, I think these numbers are fantastic and I know you need to run. So I, we can, we can wrap this up, but so I think that the numbers are great and I'm, I very much agree with you on let's get this, you know, getting this LNG out and how those numbers work. Um, and I know energy security, um, energy security is relatively bipartisan. How we get there is, is, uh, and I, I think that's where I see, you know, deep in the weeds on this, I see a big divergence. China has a lot to do with that because China is promoting climate change. China is promoting wind and solar. They're exporting that wind and solar. You know, some of the biggest exports we've had, China has exported a crap ton of solar panels, um, to Europe during this crisis. You know, they are definitely benefiting from this. So, and, but China is also a very bipartisan issue in the U S and I do think that folks in the U S have to so we need sane energy policy, right? We just need sane energy thinking. So we have to sort of get around ourselves in realizing that having hard, having difficult conversations, being able to argue with each other, I think is fantastic. Um, and disagreeing, that's perfectly okay. So it's that starting here in the US, but it's got to be done in Europe too. Uh, we have Olaf Scholz, the Chancellor of Germany, who is going over to China right now. Um, and it's a little bit crazy because the first thing out of people's mouths are saying, hey, you know, you were the ones that got us into this this Russian gas crisis. And you should be recognizing that, hey, you know, China isn't in a very good place. I mean, they've been going on a hard trajectory. That's not the trajectory the rest of the world wants. And Germany is willing to go get in bed with them on a deeper level, just signed off some of their Hamburg port to them. So we have we can't solve, we have to get the Europeans to recognize this. That's why I brought up in the very beginning, they have to sign long-term contracts. Our projects, these LNG export facilities, just like a pipeline being built for you, we have to FID these projects. And these projects also have to be permitted. And this administration sat on permits on, on LNG export facilities. Now they've said, they've talked a big game, but you actually have to do it. You have to permit these facilities. So entities like Tellurian, you know, can, I mean, when Shell and Total bow out of this stuff because Shell and Total are still pushing their green initiatives. And I think that's what's big in Europe is that until we saw the, you know, we saw Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, which never flowed gas, get sabotaged. But I think there was still a lot of talk in Europe that Russia, we, you know, in a couple of years, the war was going to end and gas would flow back through those pipelines. This is a reality check that gas probably isn't going to flow back to those pipelines from Russia and that Russia doesn't need the sale of this gas nearly as much as, as Europe wants, wants to retrieve that. So I don't think the, you know, complete head changing come to Jesus moment has happened in Europe where they realize, hey, we really do need natural gas. So I think that's got to happen. Um, and realizing and your numbers are great, but it's and it's something that we've worked on for years, as you know, with with um, Asian buyers saying, hey, 
we have the supply of natural gas. We know it can be cheap and you're going to have a reliable supply. It took them years to get on board with, we have the geology, we have the production. It's going to be very stable. Now people are okay with this. And now it comes, I think to your point, you have to recognize that we are solving your energy crisis, but we're also solving the CO2 issues. And that's the sort of, that's the big come to Jesus moment. I think in Europe is that they have to, you know, the international energy agency and either we need to throw that out completely or they need to say natural gas is a win. And they're not saying that yet. And so the politics, you know, have to be moved aside. And the great thing about this is the wordy, I mean, politics aside, the market is moving the needle, right? Uh, we are seeing natural gas. I mean, if, when natural gas prices are too high, oil is what's flipped on. And that's what we're using in power generation that drove high yeah. C, higher CO2 emissions. So yeah. natural gas is the win, but it's it's about getting the the real changes here. And I think we're a little bit off that. And the sad part is, is that, you know, the cost to these what you're hearing in Europe is these people are are spending more on their energy than they are on their rent and are on their mortgages on their utility bills. And that that's absolutely insane and super scary for this winter. Um and so I imagine your phone's going to ring off the hook. Uh, but until somebody builds it, until we can get a pipeline built, which is, I know you're working hard at doing, we, you can't we've export been out, it. We've, we've been out screaming about this for, for over a year. And I, I would say, listen, you can look at what's going on in Europe. We're already seeing the shrapnel hit in the United States with electricity yep. rates rising in New England. And understand this. The, the only thing that's standing between, you know, our American citizens going through those those tough times and, and the crippling energy prices and inflation, and all the bad things that you're definitely seeing in Europe right now. The only person standing between our Americans and that bad situation is us in this industry. And we need to make sure we need to be loud and vocal about providing a solution that addresses the root cause of people's concerns. So we can get back to doing the great work we do. And um, I was great. And, and Trish, I disagree that we disagreed on anything on this, on this, uh, on this <laughs> I got I to gotta jump. It was great catching up with you. I know. That was great. Appreciate it, Toby. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.